Scarface is a Houston rapper with a gruff baritone who's one of the most recognizable, respected voices in hip-hop. For decades now, he straddled the line between commercial and authentic, a dynamic that was once rare in the culture. Scarface's appeal was his vulnerability. His graphic depictions of hood life, paired with the psychological toll that environment took on its residents, was groundbreaking. It got the attention of rap lot Records CEO James Prince, who recruited Face to join the Ghetto Boys when he was only 17 years old. The group, which also included Willie D and Bushwick Bill, were one of Rick Rubin's earliest rap signings for his post-Def Jam label, Def American. They made national news in 1990 when Def American's distributor, Geffen Records, refused to release the Ghetto Boys' music because of its violent lyrical content. Already square in the middle of the gangster rap era, the group's lyrics pushed the genre even further. They were tagged with the label Horrorcore, the rap version of an 80s slasher film. On today's episode, Scarface and Rick talk about how Face's recent experience with COVID was eerily similar to his classic verse on Minds Playing Tricks on Me. And surprisingly, Scarface also talks about the Miranda Lambert song that makes him yearn for his childhood Texas home. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Rick Rubin with Scarface. How you feeling, man? I'm good, man. How you doing? Good. So good to see you. It's been such a long time. I know it's been too damn long, man. Look like time been kind to you, man. You're getting nice right here. Thank you. Thank you. You look pretty good yourself. You look healthy. I'm getting there, man. I understand you went through a physical transformation. Tell me a little bit about it. I just decided that I didn't want to be big no more. I was like 44 years old, Rick, and um, I decided that I didn't want to. I didn't want to go through those health risks, those the, the enlarged heart and congestive heart failure, and, and and just being overweight, obese, man. It's a lot of things that come with, you know, not taking care of your body and eating crazy. Yeah. How heavy did you get up to? I got up to 291. Wow. I'm 195 now, but I also do dialysis four days a week now because the COVID knocked out my kidneys. When did you have COVID? I had COVID February, March of 20. And do you know how you got it? I have no clue, man. Wow. Did people around you have it as well or no? Nobody else had it. Hmm. They wanted to keep me in the hospital in a small room with no lights, kind of like a, a solitary confinement. And... I ended up, you know, just opted out of staying in the hospital, man. They had the toilet up under the sink and, the, you know, inside the cabinet. And it's just like I was in the penitentiary. Wow. And I, I like being in jail, so I just scratched it all together. Were you able to go out? Like, do they let you out? I don't know how any of that stuff works. Okay, so you can leave on your own recognizance, I guess. But you have to sign a letter saying that you left against the doctor's orders. Understood. And I left and I just said, you know, well, if I'm going to die, then I'm going to die at home. And I definitely don't want to die in this box because that was, you couldn't even have visitors in my, you can't even have visitors in the hospital now. So these people that's dying, they, they die by themselves. Terrible. And I don't want to do that, man. Understood. So how long were you sick for? I was sick from the beginning of March until about April the 7th. I went to the hospital for my kidneys after that, but I, I ended up fighting the COVID. So when I first caught COVID, I couldn't breathe. And then as time progressed, I couldn't breathe. And it felt like I had the flu. And it was like the flu times 20,000. And then the, my lungs fill up with water, Rick. And then they fight the, the, the pneumonia. So that's bilateral pneumonia. So they fight the pneumonia. When they kill the pneumonia, then the, then the, the, uh, the fluid arms around my heart and then when they you know fight that off then it, it, it attacks my kidneys and then it gets it knocks my kidneys out wow so how are you feeling in general now since that if you ask me how do i feel you know just in general i'm cool but the 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 last and the effects of the covid man you know like i hallucinate wow you know i I, yeah, I see things that aren't there when I'm asleep. You know, I could be in a dream, wake up and go get water and come back, go back to sleep and be back in that same dream in that same spot. Well, that would 
segue easily into us talking about a song. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, you always thought I was crazy, man, but this is serious, man. <laughs> no, but seriously, you wrote a song a long time ago that tells the story you just told. <laughs> For real. It's unbelievable. Like, it's, 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 coming in, it's coming to life. Yeah. Tell me the story of, of uh, Mice Playing Tricks on Me. So, like, my grandmother would always walk around the house and misplace stuff. And she'd say, mm, I guess my mind must be playing tricks on me. You know, that's where the title came from. The song came from, I, you know, I wrote all three verses except for Willie's, right? Yeah. And originally, it was, the, it was my two verses and then the one that Bill raps. That was the original song that was supposed to go on the Mr. Scarface's back album. I know you remember that. Yeah. And I wrote it because, you know, that's what I was feeling. That's where my mind state was. I wrote a lot of music about dying back then, Rick. And it was because I guess I was a troubled kid. Yeah. And I think that the, I think that writing was the only outlet that I had you know, because I couldn't talk to my mom. She didn't understand it. My dad, he, he didn't know what I was going through. So I just wrote I just wrote songs. It was therapeutic. I don't know how therapeutic it was, but I did write it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting to talk about that song and that kind of song because there really was nothing like that before. In the early days of hip-hop, the subject matter was different. And then... When gangster rap came along, that was the next kind of level of hard was gangster rap. But then what you did was different than that and beyond that. And I, I guess people would refer to it as horror rap. Wow. I never really looked at that. You know, like it's like gangster rap was more real life street stories, whereas yours were more violent dreams that were, you know, more, um, more like, like horror movies. And and just showing, uh, well, not showing, but just actually putting how you felt, the vulnerability that you felt, put that in the words and recited that and put those feelings, you know, behind it when, uh, while on the mic. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The way I felt about it. I didn't realize I was doing something new, but I, I really felt like I was just writing my heart, Rick. That's yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, it's beautiful. You also have written emotional lyrics that, you know, I, I listen to your lyrics sometimes that can make me cry because it, yeah. you, you could feel the emotion in what you're saying. And it's different than, you know, for, for the longest time, rappers were just presenting, hard, you know, a hard face. You know, it was a front, basically. And there was great power that you found in being vulnerable. And it was new. It is new. It's still new. <laughs> Damn. Wow, that's heavy, man. And you know, to for, for to to be coming from you know num the number one producer, hip hop producer of all time. You, do you realize you you rock the bells? Do you realize you run DMC this shit, Rick? Like you a bad dude, man. You a beastie boy. You you a beastie boy in the game, man. Like for a statement like that to be coming from D, Rick Rubin. <laughs> wow, that's big, man. Thank you for the kind words, sir. <laughs> well, I, I love me. I've always loved music and I've always loved your music. And, um, I remember when I first heard the first thing I heard was the ghetto boys when it was still G H E T T O. Yeah. You changed that. Yeah. Rick Rubin actually changed our name from G H E T T O to G E T O boys. Yeah. And I remember hearing it and feeling like, this is the next, like, this is a progression. This music hasn't gone to this place yet. And it felt revolutionary. And that's what always excited me about music. You know, I always try to make, I always try to make stuff that was the most interesting thing in that moment, you know, and, and as a fan and look for the, you know, look for that, where's this, what's exciting about music. And it's always when someone takes it to the next level. And your writing did that. And and tell me if this is correct. I always was of the belief that you were, were you the main writer for the Ghetto Boys? I feel like you wrote a lot of lyrics, not just your verses. I wrote a lot for Bill. Will and I wrote a lot for Bill. I see. You know, Bill didn't write at all, Rick. Yeah. You know, he may have had a few ideas, but 
you know, mainly those ideas came from James and ourselves, you know, but Willie and I wrote the mass majority of the lyrics for Bushwick. How did you meet Willie? By accident. James had heard a record from me called Scarface. And he wanted me to do a, a few songs with the group Ghetto Boys. So we all went out to James's ranch. I don't know if you've ever been out there. Mm-hmm. We went out there and we, we were locked into uh, the ranch with no transportation, no nothing for like weeks at a time. He would just drop us off out there and leave, right? And we'd be like, damn, we don't even know what we had, dude. How are we going to get back to where we, you know, where we live? So we were forced to record together. And when we started, it was Willie, Bill, Bill wasn't a rapper yet, I'm sorry. It was Willie, it was myself, and it was a guy named Jukebox because Johnny C had left the group. And uh, we just started making music together and all of a sudden, it was no more Jukebox. So it was just me and Will and then we had to write the bill. So it was us three now, that's the ghetto boys that you ended up getting into um, an agreement with and do distribution for. Yeah. And they called you Action then, though. I remember they always referred to you as Action. I was a DJ. I'm probably a better DJ producer than I am a rapper, Rick. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how good, but you're... All the beats, Rick. I did a lot of those beats, man. A lot of people put their name on my beats, you know, with me. But a lot of those beats, I did those beats, man. Yeah. Yeah, I did a lot. A lot of those beats. Incredible. Did you know Mike Dean back from those days, too? Mike Dean came in on this song that I did called Street Life. Mm -hmm. And if I told you that I think that Mike is the best producer, I'd be lying. But if you ask me, is he the best engineer, mixer, musician? By far. I don't know nobody better than Mike at mixing, engineering, and, 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 and mastering and all that. That's him. Yeah. But as far as, like, your vibe... Like, the vibes didn't come from Mike Dean. Like, the, the grooves and, 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 and everything, those came from, like, Edo Joe and Beto and Tone Capone and Mr. Wing and a few more people and myself. But Mike Dean made it sound great. Yeah, he's, and he still does. He still does. I still work with him. He's incredible. He is, he is incredible. Yeah. No one better. But I met Mike Dean back in 1993 through Beto. And then from ninety in the ninety four album we worked on together with N.O. Joe, uh, Mike Dean and I worked with N.O. Joe on that on that Diary album, and then the Untouchable album, and then a couple more albums after that. You ever meet DJ Screw? I did meet DJ Screw, but we were more friends than we were uh, music partners. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I used to listen to his tapes that he would make, but I never rapped in in their ciphers. You understand? Because it was a totally different cypher from, from, from what I grew up jumping in. Yeah. You know, this, this was uh, slowed down, chopped, and screwed. And I can say screwed because screw did it. Yeah. I put you up on something, Rick. If, if screw didn't do it, then it's not screwed because screw is a human being. So if somebody's saying that it's chopped and screwed, it's not chopped and screwed. It may be chopped but it's not screwed because screw didn't do it. Yeah. If someone else did it, it would be chopped and slowed down, but it's not screwed. Yeah. Chopped in whoever his name is, but it's not screwed. Yeah. You know, and we took that real personal when people say, yeah, man, I got so-and-so, so-and-so screwed. And I'm like, well, how do you get it screwed and screw in here? Like, nah, we, we from the South side. We take screw real serious down here. I love to. I remember that, uh, what was it called? 1 a.m. or 3 a.m.? I can't 3 remember. 3 a.m., yeah. 3 a.m. That's the one. Yeah, shout out, shout out to Kiki and, and Fat Pat and Big Hawk and ESG and the whole screwed up click. Yeah. That was good music. Yeah. For me, it wasn't about the rapping. It was just about the groove. The groove was crazy. Yeah, the groove is crazy. Tell me about how did you come to write your book? I, I, you know what, Rick? I would say that the first part of my life was still on my shoulders at the time that my book came out. But once the truth about my life came out, I felt like everything was lifted off of my shoulders, if that makes sense. Beautiful. It felt like I told you or I told the world everything that needed to be known about me. Like, that was the first half of my life. And it weighed heavy on, it weighed a heavy burden on my shoulders because 
it was a lot of stories that needed to be told. That's like the theory of confessional, you know, in church. Pretty much. <laughs> you know, it was a confession time, you know. Yeah, beautiful. Do you have any kind of religious or spiritual beliefs or connection? I, you know, I just believe in God now. I believe, I, you know, it, it, you, can, you can break it down into a, a gang if you want to, because that's all religion is to me is a gang. You know, whether you're Baptist or Christian or Muslim or whatever you are, it's also, there's always somebody that's willing to take that to the extreme. But are you willing to take God to the extreme? Like, I just believe it's bigger than me. I believe it's God, period. Regardless of what denomination you want to call yourself belonging to, I just believe it's just God. You know, like, like if you can sit suspended in space, spinning on a ball with water stuck to it, light growing from it, and if you can show me a person that can make this happen, then you'll change the way I'm thinking. But for right now, I just only believe in God. I think if more people had that relationship, the world would probably be a better place. Probably so. Beautiful. Tell me your first uh, memory of hip hop, period. Any, any memories of hip hop originally? Well, my aunt moved to New York in the 60s. She bought a brownstone in Harlem. So, you know, I'm a, a kid getting takes from my cousin or going to New York when I'm a little, when I'm a youngster and actually being a part of the original hip hop. So I know all about hip hop, you know, from Cool Hurt to Red Alert to all the cats that were DJ and Molly Mall and just all of that. So I think that my earliest visions of hip hop had to be like, Curtis Blow, Mo D, and um, what's the battle, man? Classic battle. Busy B. Busy B, that battle. Breaking, B Street. I think that uh, when everybody was doing the Sugar Hill gang, I was on Curtis Blow or something, you know? All kind of stuff, man. When did you uh, first start the idea of writing instead of just listening? I had to be in the sixth grade, man. You know what really turned me into really wanting to rap? when Criminal Mind came out. That's when I knew I wanted to be a rapper. When Six in the Morning, when I first heard Six in the Morning by Ice-T, I knew I wanted to rap. That's amazing. You know, Ice-T Ice -T inspired a lot of people to rap. It really did, man. And he don't even know it, but you know, he, he to me, Rick, he talked it and he spoke about our life. You know, Six in the Morning, police at my door. Fresh should be the speaker across the bathroom floor. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah. you saw that. I was like, oh, take up the loud, let's go. You know, we saw that. Did you see the movie he made? I think it was called Something from Nothing. I didn't see that. Highly recommended. Really? Something from Nothing? I want to check that out. Yeah, it's a story of hip hop. He interviews MCs and everybody raps a cappella. And it's magnificent. Everybody. Wow. It'll blow your mind. I want to check it out. Another early rap for me, hip hop for me, on my mind big time, was a song that he did called Reckless. Incredible. It's different for Ice-T because musically that felt like more of a, it felt like more of a New York kind of beat, like um, New York club beat that eventually would have led to like Miami bass was sort of a derivation of, of that style. Um, but I don't remember a lot of Ice T's records having that kind of tempo. Yeah, it was way back early Ice T. That was back when hip hop sounded like that. Wow. You know, and, and that's early hip hop for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like when you think of breakdancing music, it's that kind of music. That was that you know, I used to break dance too. Ah, cool. Yeah, but I I, I don't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Did Bushwick Bill join the group originally as a dancer? Yes, he did, from what I understand. I wasn't in the group when he was a dancer. I see. No, but you know what? When I came to, to Houston and you guys performed for me and that we were in this little club. Yeah, we were up there more. And I remember he was dancing. Yeah, he was a dancer. Man, you know, back then, Rick, we just did what we thought was the best way to do our side of the story, you know? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that because coming from New York, it felt like, or at least for a period of time, all of hip hop music being made was coming from New York 
early on. And then the first records I started hearing from outside of New York were coming from the West Coast. Sure. But those had a different sound. And we didn't really like them so much in New York, kind of like um, Egyptian Lover, you know, the, that, that kind of stuff. And I feel like Ghetto Boys might have been the first group I heard from the South. Might have been. That's possible, not unless you, you know, you had the two live crew that made surface before the Ghetto Boys did, but... For the most part, we were one of the first acts to come out of the South, for sure. Yeah, like I was aware of the two live crew, but their music felt more like party music than rap. I, I wouldn't call it rap music. Okay. Do you know what? I, th that's how I heard it. Like I heard it as like more like party music. Right. Whereas Ghetto Boy seemed like serious rap. Okay, and and then I'm I'm in agreement with you on that, Rick. We wanted to be respected by everybody, you know, New York, especially because we knew how difficult it was to break into that New York market. Like you could never get your record played in New York. You know, New York rappers. I remember the first time we did the new, the new music seminar back in the late 80s, early 90s. We got booed and we didn't get booed by the, the audience. We got booed by the other rappers that were in the audience. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah, it was rappers that were there at the new music seminar. I'm going to say no names, but it was rappers that were booing. And then you turn around and those same rappers, you know, a, a couple of years later, they was talking about getting money too. You know, those very same rappers. Yeah. You know, we talked about our life at, 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 as ghetto boys. You know, we didn't, we didn't have the five degrees of knowledge or... You know, I didn't want to rap better than nobody else to show my skills or compare myself to a to an anvil coming down on your head and 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 cracking your head with this rap. We was talking about robbing your ass, or <laughs> breaking in your house, or stealing your car, or you know what I mean, because that was our life at sixteen, seventeen years old. When you met me, uh, Rick, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was, all, that was my life. Was there much other hip-hop music going on in the South that you were aware of? Not that I'm aware of, but I, I will say that I was the biggest Juice Crew fan ever. You know, I was the biggest LL fan ever. I'm the biggest Ice Cube NWA fan ever. Public Enemy fan ever. And then you take those, all of those rappers, all of those influences, and you mold it into one character, and that was me. Because I wanted those skills, I wanted that delivery, but I wanted my street rawness. Yeah. You know, you take all of those MCs and then put a little bit of yourself in there, and you become one of the greatest MCs known to the hip-hop culture. And I'm grateful for that. A lot of people say that about me, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Also the also the 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 lyricism and the content felt like you were coming from somewhere else. Like you could feel it. And the fact that you were willing to talk about emotional stuff that other people weren't willing to talk about. And that was interesting. What, what do you think you found the I'll call it confidence <laughs> to talk about really personal things? I have no clue. But I I you know, when I was um in the fourth, third or fourth grade, we used to have, I was in a, a, a writing class, a reading class, and the lady was teaching us speech and drama and teaching us how to write. And she always said that you had to write your heart, you know? And I add to that, that if you write your heart and you're not crying when you're done writing your heart, then you didn't write the right shit. Wow. So you learned that in school. I learned how to write my heart in school. Thank God for school, if that's the case. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying, you if if that's where you got the idea to do that, I appreciate that. I, I, I got the idea of writing my heart from school, man. Yeah, it's a funny thing. I never had a good relationship with school, but there there are moments where the right teacher says the right thing at the right time, and it yeah. clicks. I had a kindergarten teacher by the name of Miss Silva, and I was just talking to my buddy Marcus Reese about her. I was in the kindergarten, man. I'm 50 now, okay? Wow. But this lady had such an impact on my life when I was in the kindergarten until I still think about her from time to time. 
she used to come to school and she played the guitar for the class, okay, every day. And she would get out in front of those kids, man, and she would sing those songs that I had never heard before. But she would play the guitar, and I just knew that. I just knew I wanted to be a guitarist. I knew I wanted to be a musician. She had our attention for the first 15, 20 minutes of class. Bam. Just by playing and singing to us. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So you started playing guitar when you were young? Very. Wow. Yeah, my uncles, all my uncles play guitar. You know, my cousin Johnny Nash? Yes. Yeah, he just passed. I can see clearly now that Johnny Nash? That's my cousin. Wow. It's an incredible yeah. record. So we kind of grew up watching those people do their thing. Wow. And yeah, and all my uncles are musicians. My mother's a singer, musician. You know, my dad's a DJ. My grandmother's a singer. So I just come from a whole music family. Did they understand when you got into hip hop? Because I know there was always a, a line <laughs> where a lot of musicians didn't like hip hop. Yeah, it, 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 they thought it was a passing phase you would eventually grow out of. Yeah. Let the truth be told, it's still growing, though. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. How do you feel about the new? I always like, I like new. I like new things. I love new. I like new. I like to, I like to be surprised. I like to hear something I never heard before. If I want to hear something that I heard before, I'll listen to my old records. But I don't do a lot. I don't do that often. <laughs> I much more often listen to things I've never heard before whether they're new or whether they're old things that I never heard before, which, which there's an endless, you know, you can go back. I go genre by genre and um, just learn about whether it's classical music or jazz or d just different kinds of music that I never listened to when I was a kid. It, they're whole new worlds to enter. You know, I just found uh, a new, it's not new, it's extremely old, but, but it's, it's new to me. I've been listening to a lot of country music lately. Great. And um, I figure, like, if you ever had to listen to something that someone or they really wrote their hearts, it would be country music. Yeah. This lady, what's the lady's name? Miranda Lambert. She's got a song, Rick, that's, uh, The House That Built Me is the name of that song. That's that song right there. And it hit me so close in here. Yes. Like, I really understood that. I was like, oh, shit. I, 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 I feel like that. I want to go to where I grew up. Oh, listen to what she's saying. That's the power of music. That's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. Like someone who you might feel like you have absolutely nothing in common with is sharing their truth. And it could even be a personal story that has nothing to do with you. <laughs> and you can just hear the humanity in it yeah. and resonate with it and feel like this is all of us. Yeah, it's incredible, Rick. And I love music that, that pulls that out. Unfortunately, I'm not really hearing any great, don't get it misunderstood, I'm hearing good yeah. music, hip-hop, rap, but I'm not hearing great. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't look for it specifically, so the only reason I would hear it is if either someone turns me on to it or just come across it, and, and I would only notice it if, if it excited me. So other than that, I listen to... Uh, as I said, like trying to learn about other kinds of music I've never heard before. Right. The Rock the Bells, you know, both versions, the album version in particular, you knew you heard something great. When you heard um, Run DMC, uh, Dumb Girl or something, like you knew you heard something like phenomenal rock box, like, oh, damn. Like I'm looking for those records, the, the KRS one, uh, uh, Nine Millimeter Goes Bang record. Uh, the, the public enemy. I'm looking for that. Yeah. You know what I was thinking, Rick? Since the rumor had it that Rick Rubin didn't like Face in the Ghetto Boys, I think that we might just, just need to do a Face Rick Rubin record together. You never know. Anything's possible. Man, you do the production, man. And uh, you know, I can play all the instruments too, right? Amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah, I can, I can rock out too. Amazing. <laughs> do you listen to much rock music? Man, I love Megadeth. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love Metallica. I love, um, I probably know more about rock music than anybody you ever come in, in contact with. I go from Judas Priest to Molly Hatchet to, <laughs> yeah, Boston. I go, you know, 
Yeah, Led Zeppelin and, and, and all of that. How'd you get turned on to it? So my uncles were in the rock and roll. So when I go to my grandmother's house, I'd hear a lot of rock and roll. Wow. And back home to my mom's house, you know, they were in the disco and jazz and stuff, reggae and, and all of that kind of stuff. My entire family is musicians, all of them. So you got it from all sides and from different kinds of taste. It's nothing better than that. Yeah, I, I know all kinds of music, man, from Andreas Ball and Winder to you name it. Yes. When did you last see uh, Willie D? I see Willie all the time, man. Ah, great. Send my love when you speak to him. Most definitely will. Feel well. Love seeing you. And I look forward to talking to you probably this week. Good to see you, bro. Thanks to Scarface for catching up with Rick. You can check out all of our favorite Scarface and Getaway Boy songs at BrokenRecordPodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez. With engineering help from Nick Chafee, our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.